<clears throat> Call to order a meeting of Minnehaha Creek Watershed District Board of Managers on January 10th, 2019. Um, all managers are present except um, Manager Becker. And I see no members of the public, so we'll move on to item three, which is approval of the agenda. Hold we'll be approval. striking, <laughs> if I might weigh in first for a moment, we'll be striking item 4.1. With that, would you move to Manager Miller? Uh, I move approval. And is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? On the consent agenda this evening, we have approval of the December 20th, 2018 board minutes. And there are three additional, four additional consent items. Uh, resolution 19001, approval of the 2019 depository and district funds. 002, approval of the 2019 official newspaper. 003, approval of the 2019 fee schedule, and 004, approval of the short-term temporary staff for scanning projects. Um, can I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Manager uh, Loftus. Well, President White, could I either pull it to ask a question or ask a quick question on 7.4? Um, just we regarding may the as well do it now. Just ask your question. Okay. Sure. I was just curious. The, um, there's a 25% contingency on a copying project. I'm just curious what the need for it, what the need is. Ms. Reynolds. Yes. Uh, President White, Manager Loftus, the 25% um, the contingency really on there is because when we were preparing this, we were looking at we had approximately 57 boxes in storage for the uh, of old planning documents, but we've been undergoing <coughs> some cleanup efforts within the organization and cleaning out files and trying to clean out the upstairs. And so we did one last Friday, and I would say we probably came up with an additional four boxes of items to be scanned and into put into the system, and we still have more work to go. So that's kind of the contingency is because we're trying to do some cleanup at the same time and, um, and include that in there. So, and you never, as the, the length of time that it takes to do it depends on how dirty is the box and how much prep time does it take to actually prep the box for scanning? If it's a clean box, you can just run it through the scanner. If there's lots of staples to remove and paper clips and binders, um, it may take more time to prep that box. So those are the kind of the things that we were looking at when we put that variable on the end of it. Thank you. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Manager Shackleton, is there a second? Second. Manager Rodness, those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? <coughs> I do have a few announcements. The um, videos that were submitted for the uh, MOD annual meeting are now on the MOD website, including one that was sent from this watershed district about balanced urban ecology and the uh, both <coughs> projects. Um, I noticed in Hennepin County Green Note, which is their, their e newsletter, that some of the natural resource grants went to organizations in our district, including uh, Metro Blooms and Nokomis East, and SENA, uh, Metro Blooms and Conservation Corps, and also Field Community School in South Minneapolis. Um, and then the last note is that the um, Metro Mod meeting will be bumped back a couple of weeks because Capital Region is still moving into their new place. Uh, so it'll be in the January 29th, and I think Manager Olson, you're the assigned member for January, so if you could make that date, that'd be great. Um, then uh, report from Operations and Programs Committee, Manager Loftus. Yes. Thank you, President White. Um, we received a IT update from Ms. Reynolds. She informed us, um, or we learned, about the goals they developed through their business analysis that the staff <coughs> has done internally, and that coming up next is a RFP for both an IT consultant and updating our website. We also had a benefits overview with information from Mr. Whisker. And the next steps are muddy, but it'll be coming back, I assume. Muddy, but getting clearer. Yes. Thank That's you. That's all I have. Thank you. Um, then uh, CAC, Manager um, Olson. The CAC met and uh, had a very detailed discussion uh, regarding the, um, well, first they had a presentation and then we had, we were seeking their input for 
uh, partnership frameworks and solutions to come up with policies on how we go about doing our multi-tiered, multi-level partnerships with municipalities and businesses and counties and everybody else who has a stake in our projects. And uh, they broke into small groups and really got into some great detail. They, uh, uh, we, we kind of went over because they were into it so uh, <coughs> enthusiastically. Um, <coughs> they also, so those recommendations will follow and we'll try to incorporate those into uh, how we document our procedure for that. Uh, we, they had 10 members attend, and uh, uh, they also had uh, a, a note of thanks to the uh, team uh, delivering their uh, documentation and their uh, minutes on a very timely basis so that they get their paperwork early. So kudos to the staff. And then one of them uh, volunteered an idea. John Saldit said that uh, we should request that the watershed, whenever we conclude a large project, that we do a formal post-mortem, including county people, city people, all those team players that were part of it. And it may be short, it may be long, it, it, it looks at all the things that went right and things that could be better. And, um, but he says, you, it's not just necessary for you to examine it yourself, you should have everybody together at least, um, either by conference call, or Skype, or, or together as a group, but have a formal post-mortem on projects. The last thing they brought up was that Minneapolis Parks now has a uh, PAC, which is a Pesticide Advisory Committee. And uh, our former president, Jim Hawkins, is on that advisory committee. So his name is back in the environment. Thank you. Thank you. Sounds like CAC is really, um, really digging in right now. They are. The upcoming uh, meeting and event schedule is in the agenda, and Manager Becker is assigned to the February CAC meeting. Um, <coughs> then I uh, will move to the permit 18635, and we have Ms. Showalter, Lake Nicoma's shoreline enhancement. Sherry? Uh, yes. Did you circulate uh, at the December 20th meeting? Uh, that sort of uh, yearly schedule in which you've identified all the... We did approve it, um, and if you'd like a print copy... It's in the minutes. Copy, well, it it's, is, in the, yeah. it's in the minutes. Okay. I can get you a copy. All right. Thank you for the question. Go ahead, Ms. Walter. Thank you, President White, managers. Um, I am presenting this evening on the Lake Nicoma shoreline enhancement. Um, as usual, I'll start with project overview, go into the rules, which will include a discussion of the exception that the applicant has requested, um, as well, and then end with the staff recommendation. <coughs> well, unsurprisingly, the Lake Nokomis shoreline project is at Lake Nokomis in the Minnehaha Creek sub-watershed. Um, it is taking place on the northern half of the lake. Um, on that northern portion, it is the of the shoreline that is not currently either swimming beach or intact WPA wall. The existing conditions at the lake um, are pretty typical for urban lakes, so there's almost no emergent vegetation present. Um, there is a pretty significant wetland fringe in some areas, uh, but that's dominated almost entirely by reed canary grass and cattails. Uh, the upland area is almost entirely managed as turf in its current condition. Uh, the applicant is proposing an enhancement of the shoreline wetland area, um, which you can see kind of, and I'm going to be showing that in the light blue throughout. Um, so that area will be stabilized with core logs, erosion control blanket, and then it'll be seeded with a wetland seed mix, um, and there'll be um, plugs and, and some shrubs as appropriate. The applicant is also proposing a buffer zone in the upland areas adjacent to the restored wetland um, in the areas that are kind of leading up to uh, the trails. And that buffer zone will be planted with a low-growing native prairie mix, um, so they won't be mowing it. Um, it'll be prairie mix, but it'll be low enough that you'll have good views of the lake still and there'll be some trees and shrubs and plugs as well. 
Uh, in some areas where the lake conditions permit, there will also be an emergent zone with rushes and sedges, uh, which I'm showing in the dark blue. Uh, additionally, they'll be formalizing access areas um, where there's currently been a lot of erosion just from foot traffic. Um, they'll be um, stabilized with turf reinforcement mat, um, and those are areas that don't currently have any sort of wetland vegetation. So getting into the regulations, the first is the Wetland Conservation Act. Typically these decisions are made by staff, but when a variance or exception from the wetland protection rule is requested, then the board is asked to make this determination. Uh, so first, I um, actually have a boundary and type decision. Um, so the boundaries for the wetland were approved in 2017. Uh, but in review of the no loss and exemption application, the TEP recommended a minor modification be approved to it. So there is a point that we'll talk a fair amount about in this project um, that is quite eroded, um, and the boundary of that wetland was put right at the top of that bank, um, which is almost vertical. Um, the, the delineator was really delineating water resources and not wetlands. Um, and so that area is not subject to regulation under Wetland Conservation Act. It's subject to regulation under the DNR, and so that's why that um, change is being made. Uh, next is the no loss application. Um, so the applicant um, has applied under um, a provision that allows for restoration work to be done by public entities. This is the same provision that um, the board approved the, for the Arden Park project. Lastly, there are two stormwater outfalls that are, are proposed to be replaced, um, where the two stars are on that graphic, um, and that'll result in 454 square feet of permanent wetland impact. In order to meet the utilities exemption, um, they need to demonstrate minimal impact, um, which they also need to do for a rule, um, and they've demonstrated that they have taken measures to reduce the amount of impact, um, both in terms of long-term and short-term um, impacts to the water bodies. Um, and so the TEP has recommended approval of all three of the um, application types being made um, for this project. Uh, getting into the district rules um, before floodplain alteration, I'll, I'll just touch on erosion control. Um, typical to other projects, they proposed a detailed erosion control plan, including perimeter control both in water and in the upland areas, and appropriate um, stabilization methods and construction access. Uh, for the floodplain alteration rule, uh, the applicant is proposing um, some relatively small amounts of cut and fill for the stormwater outfalls. The northern outfall will have just under nine cubic yards of floodplain fill, while the southern outfall will have 13-ish cubic yards of cut, resulting in about four and a half cubic yards of increase in floodplain storage. Additionally, there will be some um, Grading in the floodplain that's associated with the shoreline improvements, um, but that will all be sort of moving around dirt within the floodplain. Most of the work of this project uh, falls under the shoreline stabilization rule. Uh, they're proposing three treatments. Most of the shoreline will be stabilized using uh, strictly vegetative means. That point we talked about will have vegetated riprap, and then the stormwater outfalls um, will also have uh, bioengineering. For the general shoreline, they are proposing to sort of rake down the topsoil that's built up uh, to have more of a flat um, shoreline, uh, which will then be seeded and blanketed with core logs installed as well. Uh, these, uh, this area all scored within the medium category of the erosion <coughs> intensity score sheet, and so the applicant could have used bioengineering um, but has chosen to use vegetative stabilization. So back to the point, um, this is the current condition there, so it's quite eroded, um, and so the applicant is proposing to use riprap in this area due to both the direction of the shoreline, which causes it to get more wave action, and just the, by virtue of being a point. So on this area, they are proposing to do riprap, um, but the upper foot or so of that will um, be planted over with um, native vegetation. And that area was, did qualify for purely structural stabilization um, under the erosion intensity score sheet. 
Lastly, those stormwater outfalls um, based on the shoreline, um, these areas could be stabilized with bioengineering, which is what the applicants have proposed. They are proposing to do kind of typical riprap at the outfall, but they will be planting it uh, with cord grass. Moving on to the water body crossings. Uh, so there are two outfalls being proposed to be replaced. Uh, they're both sort of unique. Uh, the first one uh, in this picture is sort of, it comes out at an angle, uh, which is not typical. And so they are looking to remedy that with this. Um, as you can see, it coming out at an angle has resulted in a fair bit of scour. And so they are removing a portion of the pipe in order to straighten it out. Uh, it'll be coming and then sort of filling in the area that has eroded away. Um, and then that black dot that you can maybe See on there is going to be a hydrodynamic separator, which will remove about 80% of suspended solids and 100% of floatables um, from that outfall. The second stormwater outfall being proposed for modification is this unique one. Uh, so there are two parallel um, concrete pipes that are in disrepair that go quite a bit, quite a ways into the lake. Um, they're proposing to sort of pull that back um, to have it be sort of flush with the shoreline of the lake um, and then proposing to have both of those pipes go into a single box culvert end section which will pr uh, provide for better maintenance abilities. Um, it will allow for jetting of the pipes to remove the accumulated sediment which needs to be done fairly frequently. And in both of those there won't be uh, there'll be a reduction in, in rates um, and velocities associated with those outfalls. <laughs> Last rule is the wetland protection rule, um, which the applicant has requested an exception from the buffer provision. Um, so managers may grant an exception when an alternative method or treatment is proposed that achieves a greater degree of water resource protection than strict compliance with that provision. Um, and as a reminder, the wetland buffer provision and the, the policy statements in that rule um, indicate it's to provide habitat adjacent to water resources as well as to provide filtration of runoff prior to reaching water resources. And so the applicant has requested um, an exception from both the minimum width and area for that wetland buffer. Um, this is kind of a unique project as in the, you know, our rules are generally designed for development projects where a buffer is required as you know somewhat as mitigation for development that would be happening in this case there isn't any development it's being triggered by the fact that they're doing restoration the restoration work uh, so the table shows the provided area um, in comparison to the requirement um, the bottom one is line in that is also including the riparian wetland which is serving similar function so the applicants arguments for the exception um, include that the native vegetation that is proposed for establishment will provide a greater habitat and water quality benefit than unmowed turf grass, which would be allowed under the rule. Additionally, the combination of treatments provides a spectrum of habitat and by doing so provides a greater benefit than the, that same acreage would um, as strictly upland buffer. Additional water quality benefits are provided through the hydrodynamic separator on that northern outfall, um, which is not required um, under district rules. Um, and lastly, the applicant has included the buffer in, in all the areas that they found would allow for the use of the park in its current public purpose for recreation, um, achieving a balance between the district goals of water quality, ecological integrity, and thriving communities. Just to give you an idea of kind of the areas where there's the biggest shortfalls. So this is um, an area where there's an intact retaining wall, um, which is shown in yellow. Uh, so there, there isn't any buffer provided on it because the wetland boundary goes right up to that retaining wall. And then the area further up from that um, is used kind of as a informal grassy path between um, some like an entrance to the park and the existing beach area. And so that was not proposed to be used as well and buffer do that. Is that the east beach? Yes, that is the east the beach. And mm -hmm. uh, another area um, where with the other area of the largest shortfall is an area where there's very significant wetland where the wetland width is um, 
going almost up to the edge of the trail and so only a thin amount of buffer is available in this area they are also including an emergent zone so the actual width of vegetation is pretty wide so if, the, uh, if the board of managers finds sufficient evidence to grant the requested exception staff recommends approval of the permit and of the WACA application subject to the conditions and stipulations in the staff report and those are identification of a responsible contractor an NPDES permit maintenance agreement including the locations of the buffer signs um, and a stipulation that the maximum riprap encroachment is 10 feet from the ordinary high water level this was something that the applicant has agreed to um, but wasn't able to get into the plans just due to the cycle of the development um, and then also oh, um, uh, the DNR during the comment period on the WACA application requested a condition be added to that um, requiring that erosion control materials used be designed to prevent entanglement of animals so that is added as well and with that I am happy to take any questions thank you um, may I first have a motion to approve the wetland conservation act no loss determination the exemption is defined and a revision of the boundary and type determination on the conditions stated so moved. Manager Brodness, is there a second? <coughs> second. Manager Miller. Uh, you have a question, obviously. Go ahead, Manager. Have a couple of them. Um, <clears throat> so we're prepping the point. Yes. Why? Uh, thank you, Manager White, um, Manager Shackleton. Um, because of the sort of orientation of that point, it gets a lot of wave action. So it when you're looking at sort of the graphic of the, of wave action throughout the like, circumference of a lake this is exactly where it's at its worst um, and then points are also much more susceptible to erosion um, so in order to sort of keep that point intact it really needs to incorporate some hard armoring when we rip wrapped the big island um, we did it in a way so that the rip wrap was not extremely visible it wasn't it wasn't a hard armoring but it was a soft mm -hmm. armoring that provided the capacity to, to absorb the wave energy is this a, a candidate for doing so, something like that um it's a great suggestion um, this is a unique situation in that lake nicomas is part of the grand rounds and so any work that you do here ends up going through a pretty significant historical review process and the development of this project involved a lot of negotiation between those of us on the um, environmental regulation side and those on the cultural resource side um, and it was a the cultural resource um, professionals were really wanting to mimic the historic condition of the WPA walls as much as possible um, and so they actually wanted to have a lot more riprap and this was sort of a way that we could sort of agree to have as much of the shoreline be um, really just vegetation as possible um, while conceding a small amount of riprap um, in a way to have everyone sort of so I, I used to live right down there and I know this area intimately and there's there aren't retaining walls in that section that is correct there are not um, but at one point there were um, so closer to when they were constructed in the 30s there were retaining walls around the entirety of the lake and so that's the historic condition that um, SHPO is aiming towards has the park board agreed with that uh, I'm not sure what the park board's stance is I think that you know, this was sort of a they're okay with where we're at um, and it's something that the Army Corps us I and guess, I'm sorry to cut you off yeah. I guess my, my, my root limit, the, what I'm trying to get at is it, it has a naturalized aspect mm -hmm. and um, hard armoring it the way I it's, it's usually I usually envision it is just stacking boulders much like some of the other pictures have had in here and I know there are different tactics for doing it to maintain it a different kind of naturalized environment yeah um, so here is a cross section of that area actually so um, so right here is the ordinary high water level um, and then here one foot above that is where the vegetation will start so this area will be covered with topsoil and then seeded and blanketed um, so they'll be, you know, assuming that the water level is usually around the ordinary high, there'll be about a foot of exposed riprap. Is there, is there a drop off right there? This area does have pretty steep bathymetry. Okay. Um, okay. 
the outfalls, one of the, so there are 11 outfalls that flow into the lake that are untreated, and I think two, maybe three that are treated. Um, and the last big one was put in at 50th. The idea of having a hydrodynamic separator makes sense. Um, where's, and I, and that's, that was on the, the north end. Yep. And that's right by the parking lot, right? Yes. And the, the other one that shoots into the lake, I can't picture that. Where is that? Um, <coughs> is it a faster way to get back here? Um, <laughs> so it it's just north of that point. Um, so there's sort of an area there where the two trails sort of come together, yep. um, and that's where that's at. Is that is that right by where the um, oh shoot, where the digit the, the the deciduous conifers the uh, tamaracks? Yeah, there's a stand of tamaracks right over here. It's like four or five of them. Is Becky in the room? She might know. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I really couldn't tell you. What I'm, what I'm really getting at is this: this that that area right there is between between the road and the and the and the path is incredibly moist year round. Um, it doesn't dry; it rarely dries up in mm -hmm. August. And it, those are public works, Minneapolis public works pipes. Yes. Has was there any consideration of pulling them? Back further, or doing something to either slow rate of the rate of flow, or to to do something to pull sediment. So, and that um, in both of them, they are reducing by the changes that they're making to the end sections. They are going to be reducing velocities. Rates are going to be about the same. Um, they did pull that one back somewhat, um, and the the changes that were made to those were in response. We're at the request of the public works maintenance staff um, of kind of there's, ways to address there, there, the, the challenges. <laughs> yeah, um, particularly in the eastern outfall is one where they've had significant difficulty in maintaining it, um, partially because of the close proximity of the pipe. So by having them go to one end section, they're able to maintain them more easily. Um, yes. So was there, I mean, was there... Is there any exploration of pulling them out of the lake or doing something other than just shortening them so that they're up against the shoreline? Um, I'm not sure to what extent they considered that. I think um, something along those lines is kind of beyond the scope of this project that, you know, it's a, it's a park board project and the city, upon seeing that, kind of was looking for what are kind of the low-hanging fruit around the lake and not looking to make any sort of major changes, but more of a minor modifications to address kind of the worst offenders. And it's I think like an opportunity for us to engage to help them. Am I wrong? Manager Miller? That, that was the point I was going to make. It seems like it's an opportunity here. We missed... Uh, you know, engaging a city and the park board and us in, uh, in resolving uh, or making a, a, an improvement that otherwise uh, wouldn't happen if we, you know, we're the ones the main interest in uh, a little surprise. One of the other elements that was kind of floating around mm -hmm. the back of my head other than knowing this is really wet land right in there, is when you look at the Met Council's um, flood prediction maps, this, there's a, there's a hill right there between, this, between this, the, the yellow star and the gap. Mm -hmm. Like, there's a bank right, an old bank right there. And there's low land just south and to the east, and there are persistent flooding issues down there. If there's an op I mean, if there's an opportunity for us to partner with the park board and, the, and Minneapolis Public Works to address something, yeah, and that's certainly something we can explore. If the managers would like, um, we could per potentially have, um, if we want to allow kind of the timeline of review to move forward, the board could approve an exception, and we could come and then, you know, outline conditions under which staff could issue the permit. Um, I know that they're looking to break ground fairly soon, um, but are also 
still waiting on Army Corps permits as well. Mr. Whisker? Um, a couple of thoughts. I think those are really good comments, and we've been spending a lot of time, Tom has, with the Citizens Advisory Committee and with staff internally designing processes for the permitting program where when permits come in, they get screened, and we know, you know what the opportunities are for partnership, and that's something that's sort of an ongoing process for continuous improvement, how we identify opportunities, route them early, and we've talked about that with the board before, whether it was on um, <coughs> some projects in St. Louis Park or wherever, how you're getting those early. That aside, um, I do know that the, the park board within the last 18 months adopted an Nokomis area master plan. And within that master plan, they identified all the priority sites for stormwater on uh, an order of priority basis for which ones are delivering the most nutrients to the lake. We know that the project for the outfall that we've that we were partnered on in, in past years to minimize creek overflow into the lake was one of the principal sources of nutrient loading. So the remaining outfall projects and stormwater projects that the park boards identified are their projects. They're in the master plan. I don't know off the top of my head without having that in front of me where those stormwater projects are and how they align with these outfalls. Um, and that's information that we could easily come back with and answer where those are in terms of their queue. Um, in terms of the master plan, they're tackling all of the shoreline restoration enhancement work. And that involves, as they work their way around the shoreline, pulling back some of the outfalls, repairing those, and it doesn't preclude, this project and this investment around the shoreline doesn't preclude at all the ability to pull those back and do stormwater in the future. And in fact, that might be the park board's plan for some of these based on its master plan. The other thing to keep in mind is just the level of attention that um, Nokomis has had recently with high groundwater levels and these areas being wet and the level of um, the, the, the negative perceptions associated with stormwater management around the Nokomis area, um, the ponds that we've put in, the outfall structure, and how those contribute or don't really contribute to local surficial groundwater levels. So um, that's just sort of a point of reference, I think, for the for the board. Um, in, in terms of next steps, I mean, this is a shoreline permit. That's the park board's permit. It's your prerogative if you want to put that on hold and have us come back and answer these questions, or if you want to move this forward, as, as Ms. Showalter mentioned, approving the exception and have us come back at the next meeting with information. But it would be my guess that if we were to take a look at the master plan, the park board's got um, stormwater improvements planned for the Nokomis area that they're going to be undertaking their themselves in subsequent years, and that moving this shoreline application forward is not going to preclude that work. But if you want that information before you make this decision, we can certainly get that for you. Andrew Shackleton. Um, I think your I think your analysis of the politics is right. That there's a lot of attention on the flood and, and how stormwater management with the lake is has a lot of attention. Um, <coughs> the, the the pipe on the north, I'm presuming, captures water from from the, the community center and the parking lot, and possibly from the road itself. I don't know. Um, I believe it's the road itself is the primary. How, do, you know, do you have any sense for how much? <laughs> well, I'm not going to hold you to your answer because <laughs> no. that's, that's not the scope. But um, I like I think you're I think you're right about the public concern of how water is, the stormwater management is, is happening here, and that's not the purview of the park board. And so it's not really the purview of the city of Minneapolis. How it works, and it's beyond the scope of their permit, but it is something that. Those two agencies should pay attention to, and I, like we should as well to a certain mm -hmm. extent. Elizabeth, can you tell me what the construction schedule is? Um, so they, well, the the construction schedule has been fairly fluid. I think at one point they were going to bid in October. Um, that has passed. Um, they are currently looking to go to bid in February, um, but they still do not have a core permit in hand, um, and so it is 
They are waiting to go to bid until they have core approval. So construction will be next next winter. I think they they haven't they because the fluidity of the schedule they're not I think they've gone back and forth on whether they'll do winter work or do some of it as summer work. Um, sure. Is there, I mean, would it be, would we, how much time would it take to figure out kind of what the, what the sub watersheds are that dump water through these pipes into, into the lake and um, whether there could be options to slow the rate down beyond what was proposed? Mr. Whisker. Um, it looks like legal counsel might have something to say about just schedule and process, but in, in terms of bringing back information about drainage areas around Nokomis, how they've been priority ranked for stormwater treatment in the master plan, and how that fits into this permit and overall partnership opportunities, we can turn that around for the next meeting. Mr. Um, Manager White and Managers, Elizabeth, what is the status of this project as against the statutory time frame for making a permit decision from receipt of the complete application? Uh, the 60-day deadline um, is happening, I believe, on Monday. I have already sent out an extension of the 60-day, um, sort of to, in case of these sorts of situations. Um, so we do still have about 60 days if we go all the way to the 120. So, we have some wiggle room. So, we could approve the permit and get a report next week and still know that this other work is, we wouldn't be stopping the work from going forward. Could we approve two parts? There was a three part. Uh, yes, Mr. Walter. Managers, I would, rec if you're, if board wishes to approve portions of it, uh, I think the best way to do that would be to approve the exception and the Wetland Conservation Act portion, as both of those need to be approved by the board, um, whereas the permit itself can be approved on a staff level if, you know, circumstances require that. If the board delegates that decision-making authority to staff for the permit decision, because the, the permit now is to the board rather than taking some separate action to withdraw the administrator's decision to bring this one forward. Oh, I guess it's the exception that brings it forward, but the whole permit is in front of the board at this point. The permit, the WACA, and the exception. The exception is part of the permit, not WACA. <clears throat> so the motion I'd asked for was for the um, WACA determination exception and um, boundary type um, Revision, laundry and type revision. So that's the motion that we have in front of us right now. We're ready to vote. Except that no one made that motion. Yes, it was. I think I did. I had a motion in second. Mm -hmm. Was it? You did. You did. My apologies. Yeah. You Robinson did. Robinson Hill. Yep. Robinson and Robinson. Robinson. Oh, those two. Yeah. Oh, those two. Okay. These two guys. Never mind. Okay. Are we ready to vote? Will this would this come back? I'd like I'd, I'd like to have a sense for or if Mr. Whisker. Manager Shackleton, managers, if you act on the permit tonight, it won't be coming back. And we can certainly bring back the information you want. If you're uncomfortable doing that, we can bring the whole package back at a subsequent meeting. And that's that's your prerogative. Mr. Welsh. It is, except the sort of design input that the board is looking for and exploring some opportunities strictly speaking the applicant and the, the uh, has made according to staff's presentation and the report in the packet that decision is before the managers to be made on that basis so if you exclude it excuse me approve the exception in the WACA it would be odd to not approve the permit at the same time all those things having been said Ms. Showalter has explained that the timing is you're not up against it because she's already issued an, ex uh, an extension. Mr. Major Miller. Uh, there's the issues in the Nokomis are so complex, and some is based on science and some is based on uh, rumor and others based on politics. That I, I don't really want to get in the middle of it uh, because uh, science doesn't seem to have much of a chance in the discussion. So. Uh, 
I think that we should uh, look for. I'm a little disappointed that we didn't explore the opportunity a little more. Uh, we've been talking about this for uh, <coughs> two years now. I mean, this new strategy. But uh, I don't want to get involved in uh, in second guessing the park board or the public works department, or uh, especially at this time and at this location. It's just there, there's no the benefits are not worthy of the effort and the criticism. We get. I think if we get the science wrong, <coughs> it, it it adds fuel to anybody who you know throws Molotov cocktails at us. Um, and I, I'm not asking for anything more than just to get better information about whether there's a reasonable expectation that we could do something. And if the core hasn't, if the core hasn't issued their permit, I think a week or two weeks wouldn't kill it. I could be wrong, but. Mr. Whisker. <clears throat> Again, I. I'm not saying anything the board doesn't know. It's it's your decision, but I don't think that there's too much risk. Um, and from what I'm hearing, in terms of permit deadlines, compromising construction schedule, relationships, in bringing this back and bringing you the permit and providing you the information around how the area works. But it's your decision how you want to parse that tonight. We can come back at the February meeting or the January 24th meeting rather with that information if that's how you want to handle it and the permit and exceptions. Um, I'd just like to get a sense of whether we have a majority to approve that motion or we should withdraw it because we don't want to turn it down. I'd approve it. But I'm just asking for more information. Mm -hmm. and if the park board thinks it's, there's, there's an opportunity for something more, we Put some money into it and get a better ecological outcome. Ms. Uh, Manager, uh, I would also like to note that um, while we didn't have an extensive engagement process on that um, eastern outfall, we did kind of have discussions about whether that end section was appropriate, and with that, um, some discussion as to whether some sort of inline structure would be appropriate. But because of the way the pipes are oriented, they would require a more significant disturbance all the way up to the road um, because it's. The strange two outfalls that you couldn't easily put something in line, um, but we can certainly continue that engagement as well. <coughs> what do you mean by in line? Uh, so, like a sump catch basin or a hydrodynamic separator, where it's really part of the storm sewer, as opposed to a separate structure like an underground um, chamber system or rain garden. I, I, I got another comment. I was on that original uh, was it Blue Water Commission, yeah. mm. and. Uh, you know, they had high uh, high aspirations for uh, solving a, a lot of, you know, some good things came out of it, you know, the ponds at, at Calhoun and, and these ponds, but it it seemed to be not very comprehensive. Uh, you know, it was like the first phase, uh, and uh, I don't think anybody that would look at those ponds today would argue that they aren't an improvement. They were just soggy mowed grass before. And uh, I, I, I think we should just use it, go back and look at the, at the Blue Water Commission's recommendations and subsequent work and see if there's, uh, see if there's uh, an opportunity here that we're missing, you know, that's been, uh, been identified in, uh, in, um, and support it in the past and see if you know, we at least know, know that much. It seems to me that there have been so many parties involved in a lot of, of various regulatory authorities and a lot of negotiation and, and um, mutual um, agreement and it has come down to this and that if we approve this we are not in any way precluding future right. discussions or gathering information. So it's my thought that we should approve this, um, these determinations and the permit this evening, but then ask for a report back at a subsequent meeting so that we don't hold up the process for no reason. I'd agree with that. Are we ready to vote then on the um, 
whack at exception and revisions. Those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed? No. And um, thank you, Manager Shackleton. Now we have the permit with those. Um, yeah, are, are we uh, including that motion as a request for subsequent information? Is that I don't know that we need a motion, but. I'll move that. I'd like subsequent information on what opportunities ex have been identified in the past and have not been attempted to reduce the pollutant load and the velocity of flow into Lake McCombs. I'll second that one. Discussion? Those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, now may I have a motion on the permit to approve uh, permit. I've lost track of the number. Um, President White, the yes. exception should be the next. I believe motion. we already approved that. The motion was to approve the, the WACA determination. And the 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 thank you very much. Thank you, Papa. And, <laughs> and the uh, change to boundary type, those were all approved in one motion. Okay. And now there's been an interim motion um, for more information. Okay. We're back for more permitting. Now, is there a motion to approve the permit? Move approval. Andrew Miller, is there a second? Second. Manager Rodness. Discussion? Those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Manager Shackleton. Thank you very much. We'll show Walter. The next item on the agenda is election of officers for this board. <coughs> and um, as you know, that can be done by a motion or by a nomination. And the first office is president. I move uh, Sherry White be uh, uh, nominated for president. Or I nominate uh, Sherry White for president. Is there a second to the motion? Second. Manager Olson. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. The next office is um, vice president. Is there a motion or nomination? I'd like to uh, nominate Manager Olson. Manager Olson, I would second that nomination, that motion. Um, those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, Bill. Um, next office is treasurer. Is there a motion or nomination? I nominate Dick Miller. Second. And nominate and second. Those in favor, <coughs> please say aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> next office is secretary. Is there a motion or nomination? I move Edward uh, Drognes uh, for uh, secretary. Is there a second? Second. Manager uh, Loftus. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you very much, everyone. And thank you, um, Manager Shackleton, for nominating your successor. And thank you, Manager Olson, for agreeing to serve. Thank you all. Item 11.2 is Resolution 19.005. We have Ms. Um, before she begins, mm -hmm. uh, they've started construction last week on uh, uh, on the park. And it's if you haven't gone, if you haven't have, have a chance, go over and take a look at it. Okay. It is it is so. Uh, <clears throat> You know, I've been listening to this discussion for a couple of years, or at least, it seems like longer, but maybe it's only been a couple of years. And I never realized how big the park is until they cut all the oh. buckthorn down. It's it's enormous, a piece of property. <laughs> and, and the creek is, is not visible from any place, except if you're, you uh, you would fall into the creek because you <laughs> wander back through the woods. Uh, so this is, this is going to be really a major uh, uh, improvement, and it's really... Looking at it. Sounds like we should all trips over there. We'll have six field trips. Ms. Damianchet, over to you. Thank you. Uh, President White, managers, um, thank you. Staff tonight is seeking authorization uh, to execute a grant agreement with the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources for Conservation Partners Legacy Grant Funding for the Arden Park Restoration Project. A little bit of background on the Conservation Partners Legacy Grant Program. Uh, the program <coughs> provides competitive matching grants to fund conservation <coughs> projects that restore enhance or protect forest wetlands prairies and habitat for fish, game, and fish in Minnesota. A 10% grant match is required of the grantee. Um, 
the district uh, uh, accepts the grant, uh, the district will provide a 20% in-kind match um, of personal time to oversee the, the work itself. Uh, evaluation criteria are focused on direct habitat benefits related to restoration on lands with public access and recreational opportunities. Um, the grants range from $5,000 to $400,000 to local, regional, state, and national nonprofits and government entities. Um, are funded by the Outdoor Heritage Fund and are recommended by the Lizard Sam's Outdoor Heritage Council to the Minnesota Legislature and Doug Sells Institute. The application process um, essentially, staff has submitted a work plan detailing restoration plans and the project's purpose um, in sub watershed uh, by habitat and water quality improvements. Uh, following an unsuccessful CPL application in 2017, district staff met with CPL staff and got some guidance about what they're specifically, specifically looking for uh, in uh, work plans um, and found that the uh, applications are typically about evaluated on funding um, that um, has cost-effective um, uh, work, um, uh, overall project value, uh, history of successful conservation work, um, and projects that provide multiple benefits. Uh, Pre-project monitoring, monitoring of the Arden Park site uh, determined that the woodland was dominated by woody invasive species. Over 30% of the uh, woodland understory is dominated by buckthorn. Um, and currently, um, a subcontractor to um, our prime, contract, prime contractor uh, is currently working to remove uh, the buckthorn from the understory. And you can tell from these few pictures that the uh, understory, as uh, Manager Miller has noted, is really opened up with the removal of the buckthorn. Um, however, the removal of all this buckthorn has uh, left some steep slopes um, and not much uh, habitat cover uh, in the woodland areas. Um, and so the CPL grant funding will support the uh, planting of 900 trees and shrubs as bare root plant material, which will cost effectively reestablish a diversity of plant community uh, throughout the woodland in the western five acres of the park, um, which is the area shown in the outline green essentially the woodland area to the west of the park. The grant award would be for $22,500 for upland restoration. And as I mentioned, um, the district would provide a 20% in-kind uh, match for oversight of the installation of the plant material. Uh, work is supposed to be completed by June 30th of 2021, which uh, aligns well with the construction installation and also our warranty establishment period, which will run through 2021. And before I close, I just want to quickly provide um, an update on another grant application uh, for the Arden Park project. Uh, district staff has um, submitted an application to Hennepin County Natural Resources Opportunity Grant Fund. Uh, the project has been recommended to receive um, that grant in um, the amount of around $33,000, uh, which will be um, taken to the county board later this month for approval. Um, and to close, the, again, Steph is uh, requesting authorization to execute a grant agreement with the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources Conservation Partners Legacy Grant Funding for the Arden Park Restoration Project. Any questions? Thank you. Is there a motion to adopt Resolution 19005? Move. Oh. Manager Miller, is there a second? Second. Manager Olson. Questions for Mr. Mianchic? I wanted to comment that it's 005. It must be the year, right? <laughs> <laughs> All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. <coughs> Not much controversy there, right? <laughs> um, Ms. Clark, we have a set of resolutions here from 19006 to 010. So I will let you organize that the way you'd like to. Chair White, Board of Managers, before you tonight are five local water management plans. I will review them in the order they are on the agenda. And um, the cities of Deep Haven, Greenwood, and Woodland, I'll provide some um, geographical context together and then request board action for each as they're ordered on your agenda. Um, first, I'll review the Richfield local water management plan. Um, followed by Minnetonka Beach, and then together, Deep Haven, Greenwood, and Woodland. Um, providing watershed orientation, plan summary, and then areas of coordination um, with each city. Um, first, Richfield is located in the very lower part of the watershed district. 
The city of Richfield um, in the darker area includes parts of three different watershed districts. The central portion is Richfield Bloomington Watershed Management Organization. The southwest corner is Nine Mile Creek Watershed District and the remainder in blue and that area outside of Richfield highlighted in blue in Minneapolis is the Minnehaha Creek Watershed District. Geographically, Richfield's bounded on the north by Highway 62, the south, Interstate 494, the east, Highway 77, and the west, France Avenue. The water resource, uh, prim primary water resource within the city of Richfield is Legion Lake, which drains north through Taft Lake in Minneapolis, and then to Lake Nokomis in Minneapolis, um, which is on the state's <coughs> impaired waters list. For nutrients. Again, Richfield's part of the Minnehaha Creek sub watershed, um, which is an area of focus for the watershed district due to the complexity of natural resources and the um, issues within some of the state's most prized recreational resources. The Taft Legion, or the um, City of Richfield is the location of a recent capital improvement project by the district, the Taft Legion Capital Improvement, which is aimed at nutrient load reduction for Lake Nokomis, which is again impaired for nutrients. That project was ordered in 2012 and complete in 2016 in partnership with the City of Richfield. The city is the lead agency designing, um, building, operating, and maintaining the project with funding from the district um, uh, according to the cooperative agreement. I believe there have been some staff reports on the project uh, previously, but as a matter of brief update, um, staff is working closely with the city of Richfield on project performance. The first indicators of performance were below expectations um, after, the, after the 2017 uh, growing season. Uh, the city has brought on a consultant and made some changes primarily to the flocculation system, um, which has increased performance. Uh, some other um, improvements for 2018 are being discussed, sort of structural improvements with the flocculation system. The project overall is a combination of flocculation and um, water reuse. Um, for load reduction, uh, so staff is continuing to work closely with the City of Richfield on um, project modifications, um, operations, maintenance, and monitoring for that. The coordination plan provided in your packet um, is very robust, recognizing the district's balanced urban ecology approach and coordinated land use planning and the coordination of regulation and permitting within the district. The coordination plan specifically does talk about uh, coordination of operation and maintenance of that Taft Legion improvement project um, and includes the uh, project agreements by reference in that part of the plan section. The city of Richfield is choosing to continue to implement district rules for erosion control, floodplain alteration, stormwater management, and wetland protection, and also can, choosing to continue um, LGU status or the Wetland Conservation Act within the city. Staff recommendation is approval of the city of Richfield's local water management plan. Hold the roll. Is there a second? Second. Two seconds. Any discussion or questions? Yeah. Can you define flocculation? Um, it's using a chemical to uh, bind and settle out <coughs> phosphorus in, in the water column. So it's, um, I think, a similar treatment system to what um, my colleague, Ms. Brown, has talked about for the Halstead Bay um, treatment at the end of Six Mile Creek. Oh, okay. What, what, what percent of, uh, of expectations are they meeting uh, on the, uh, with the results of the, of the, of the facility? Um, manager Olson managers, the initial removal rates were... I'm Manager Miller. Manager Miller, I'm sorry. Um, the initial <laughs> removal rates were, sign, um, I think, kind of significantly lower. The 
2017 monitoring showed um, in one part of the system up to 70 or 80 percent removal rates, which is an improvement. The range of expectations for removal, I believe, was pretty large. Um, so I think we're continuing to look at how structural changes to the system can be made at how that system works and then um, how it's being operated and maintained um, to reach maximum performance. Um, aren't we kind of in a situation here where we better make sure it works pretty well before we continue talking about six six mile application for a similar kind of project? I mean, it's a considerable amount of money. We're going to be paying for this for 20 years in Richfield. Different technique. Is it different? Vastly different. Manager Miller, um, President White managers, I think that's a fair assessment. Um, you know, the level of due diligence that we're doing on Six Mile is significantly different and informed by the design parameters and pre-project testing that Richfield performed. And we've talked about that before. I don't know how deep you want to get into that tonight, just in terms of the water quality monitoring data that they had for Taft Lake, where <coughs> they took the monitoring data, the range of data across the season, the range of data across years could have been better. Um, and that informed some of their base assumptions about removal. And had they had better, I think, uh, water in-lake water quality data, that would have informed their estimates about removal. The design of the system is quite different. Um, and so, yes, we're thinking about all those things as we start to look at Halstead Bay, and we actually factored in a lot of those considerations and discussed that with the board before the board made the decision to pursue the land acquisition with Three Rivers. So um, that's something that you're curious about receiving an update on. We can, we can get that back in front of you, but you're right. That's dramatically informing our approach for Six Mile. Were you also thinking of Wasserman West, which is probably the next thing that happens, though? No, I was because oh, okay. that uh, Halstead Bay Six Mile Creek project is considerably bigger than this one. And, you know, I, I'm sure we're not going to use the same vendor and engineer and consultants and everything. But uh, you know, we've, we've, we're paying debt service on that facility every year, and we, we should make sure that it's, it's mm -hmm. there's the benefits that we expect. So when will we know the effects of the improvements they've made? Chair White, Board of Managers, there's annual monitoring, mm -hmm. and we've got two years now of monitoring. The second year, um, with some tweaks to the block system operation, has improved performance. The I believe it'll be an annual ongoing evaluation of how it's performing, how modifications are affecting its performance, mm -hmm. and you know, annual updates in terms of O and M, I believe can be expected. It's, Thank they're you. still Thank using that, Mr. Whisker. I think if you're satisfied with that answer, I don't need to add okay. more. Manager, also. They're still using that floating island technique out there on the lake. No. Manager Olson, I'm not aware of that. In other words. The, how they introduce the flock to the lake. Uh, Manager Olson, managers, I'm not intimately familiar with the design of the systems, but I believe um, they're routing water kind of offline through a system treating it and putting it back in line is the short of it. Mr. Meehan. This just sounds like a fun topic to talk yeah. about. <laughs> um, so, Manager, President White, Manager Olson, what they're doing is they're pulling water on the bottom of Tank Lake mm -hmm. and introdu introducing it into a building that injects the alum, so that creates the flock, and then re, re, re putting it back into the lake. And then the alum and the phosphorus that they, they collect goes into the sanitary and then goes out. But the collection device? Yes, it's actually at the bottom of the lake. Stationary or does it move it, around? It's stationary. stationary. So it goes to the low part of the lake, which is where you typically Isn't there something in the middle of the lake, though? Like a, I, I can just picture like a box mm -hmm. that has water shooting up the top. There's a, I guess I'm not as familiar with that, but typically 
it's associated with the aeration component of it that they'll have as far as just relief. Manager Miller? Well, who is doing the testing? The city is doing the testing. Uh, and are we comfortable with that? And Mr. Whisker. Um, Manager Miller, Manders, yeah, I think we're comfortable with the corrective actions that are being taken. And if you want, we can come back and Becky can give you a comprehensive update of how we're stepping through that. What we did is, you know, we, we um, alerted the board of the fact that the project that we partnered on with Richfield isn't meeting design expectations. And we had framed exactly mm -hmm. by how much. I don't have those numbers in front of me. And we <coughs> talked about next steps and what next steps the board would like staff to take. And that's what we're in the process of doing. And the next steps are really, we'd identified it's not meeting performance expectations. And we'd identified some of the reasons why. Some of the reasons included um, they may have overestimated the actual removal capabilities period based on how they'd sampled the lake for existing water quality. So that's a big one. And then we looked at where they're pulling from, so the actual location of withdrawals. They're doing hypolimnetic withdrawal in an area where it's anoxic and you've got that dissolved phosphorus. So we looked at where they're withdrawing. We looked at a big component of it was they had complete staff turnover and they had their public works um, water supply staff operating the system because it's similar technology, but they had a bunch of issues with that where they essentially mixed the wrong chemicals and clogged the system. So we had to look at making sure that they were actually using the right chemical composition, they had to wash all the lines, place pumps, that sort of thing. And so we've looked at the water quality data, where they're drawing from, the chemical mix, and we've come up with a plan for how they're supposed to evaluate the system and making sure that the data that they're providing us gives us confidence that if it's working or not working, that that's an accurate representation of if it's not working or not working. Yeah. And then the first tweak that they've started making is um, how they're actually operating the facility with the chemicals. And the performance levels have gone up, but they're still not meeting minimum design standards. So now the next round of conversation for the upcoming growing season is, are you adding more pumps and cycling more water? What level of structural improvements are you going to make to see if you can hit design standards? So what we talked to the board about is triaging and stepping through operations, infrastructure, and once they've exhausted and gone through those curative methods, which are outlined in our cooperative agreement, if they exhaust all those and there's no practical alternative to meeting those design standards, then we'll, have, we'll be at a junction point where we can, we'll have another decision to make. And if you'd like um, sort of a status report on that, we're happy to get that back in front of you. Well, when we approved this, this was very controversial on the board. because Several of the members did not want to do a, a factory process. They wanted to do a natural process and objected uh, pretty vehemently against it. And uh, uh, we were assured that by everybody this would be, uh, this would be effective. And, you know, I, I, I think with, uh, we're going to have more, more and more opportunities to implement this kind of, of treatment uh, as the district gets more intensely built. And uh, I think we've got we to gotta do everything we can to make sure this thing works as, as prescribed. So, yeah, I'd like, Agreed. To, I'd like a report on that. I've lost track. We have a motion and second. Any further discussion? Manager White? Yes. Um, just to add a little bit to what Renee provided in her presentation and then also but highlight something that's in the resolution where the managers are being recommended by staff to approve the local plan based on the city operating the regulatory program under the statutory framework. The district needs to find that the city ordinances and the city's control system is as effective or better in protecting water resources than the watershed district rules and Ms. Clark's uh, request for board action and the resolution statement makes that finding, but I just wanted to point that out because it's a linchpin in the system for ensuring a regulatory program that's effective and is a close it, and critical hardwired connection between the way the city's regulatory program works and the watersheds. There are others beyond that that we're working with staff to make sure that that's 
system works as seamlessly <coughs> as possible, but I just did want to briefly bring that to the manager's attention. Thank you. <coughs> Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? On to <coughs> the talk of each. Chair White, Board of Managers, um, next before you is the Minnetonka Beach Local Water Plant. The City of Minnetonka Beach is central to the Upper Watershed and Lake Minnetonka. The city itself is about 1.5 square miles, located between Crystal Bay to the north and Lafayette Bay to the south. It's bisected by the County Road 15 and the Dakota Regional Trail. The primary land use in Minnetonka Beach is single-family residential, um, with one large exception of a 40-acre parcel, which is the Lafayette Country Club, a large golf course. That piece of the city drains north to um, Crystal Bay. The um, <coughs> bays in which Minnetonka Beach drains to have um, fairly good water quality. The issues um, identified by the district's plan in the Minnetonka subwatershed are generally excess nutrients, uh, localized flooding, and altered shorelines and um, ecosystems. The management strategies for Lake Minnetonka are primarily focused, um, taking our focal geography approach in the Six Mile Creek Halstead Bay subwatershed and the Painter Creek subwatershed which drain to the most polluted bays on Lake Minnetonka on the states and pairs waters list. Throughout the subwatershed, management strategies are resource protection through, through regulation and promoting shoreline EMPs to prom promote ecological integrity. The City of Minnetonka Beach coordination plan includes annual meetings, regulatory coordination, and then the city's Local Water Management Plan specifies that the district will continue to implement its rules and retain local government unit status for the Wetland Conservation Act. The staff recommendation is a approval of the Minnetonka Beach Local Water Management Plan. Thank you. Is there a motion? So moved. Manager Olson, is there a second? Second. Manager Resheckled, any questions or comments? Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> Thank you. Chair White Board of Managers, finally, I've got Deep Haven, Greenwood, and Woodlands Local Water Management Plan. Um, these three cities are geographically next to each other on the east side of Lake Minnetonka. They share administrative staff and services, actually, and the same consultant wrote their plans. So I'll provide the geographical context um, together of those three cities and then um, summarize each local water plan and request board action in the way they're listed on the agenda. First, for reference, I've circled Minnetonka Beach again in the middle of Lake Minnetonka. And then on the east portion of the upper watershed in Lake Minnetonka are the cities of Woodland, Deep Haven, and Greenwood. Zooming into this area, again, there's Minnetonka Beach. Um, just beyond that, you'll see Big Island in the middle of the lake. Um, here's the watershed district office. <laughs> And um, to orient you, that's 494 and Highway 7. We've got the city of Woodland, which is 0.6 square miles below the city of Deep Haven, 2.3 square miles in size, and then the city of Greenwood, 0.4 square miles in size. With the blue line through the middle of Deep Haven, you'll notice that's the watershed district boundary between Minnehaha Creek on the Lake Minnetonka side and Riley Purgatory Bluff Creek Watershed District on the east side. That divide is actually Minnetonka Boulevard in Deep Haven. <coughs> Again, the subwatershed <coughs> issues I just covered, the cities of Greenwood, Deep Haven, and Woodland drain to the um, lower Lake South, actually, and partially to Wyzetta Bay. Again, management strategies in this part of the watershed are primarily resource protection through regulation and promoting things like BMPs to improve ecological integrity of the shoreline. Deep Haven's local water management plan summary um, identifies 
uh, infrastructure renewal and drainage improvement projects, and then implementation of minimum control measures in their stormwater <clears throat> pollution prevention plan to address those issues. Um, the primary coordination with Deep Haven is through annual meeting and they also reference regulatory coordination and coordination of their CIP. In Deep Haven, the district will continue to implement its rules and retain the local government unit status for the Wetland Conservation Act. So staff recommendations. Is there a motion to adopt resolution 19008? So moved. Manager Rodmans, is there a second? Second. Manager Shackleton, any comment or question? Those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> okay. Next on your agenda is the Greenwood Local Water Management Plan. Greenwood has not identified water resource issues to address within this local water management plan. They address um, resource protection through street utility improvement projects and again implementation of the minimum control measures identified in their stormwater pollution prevention plan. Um, similar coordination through annual meetings and regulatory coordination and again the district implements its rules and is the local government unit um, that implements the Wetland Conservation Act. Staff recommendation is approval. Thank you. Is there a motion to can, approve? Can I ask a question first? Uh, yes. Uh, they will implement, they will retain that local government uh, status for uh, WACA. Now they don't have a staff, so who does that? Is it contracted out? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Manager Miller. Managers, the district will continue to implement its rules and retain the implementing WACA that we'll, didn't we'll maintain it. Okay. the district All right. will. It's unlike the other. Is there a motion to adopt um, resolution 19009? So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Any further mm -hmm. discussion or comment? Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? One more. So, Woodland Local Water Management Plan also did not identify specific water resource issues to address within this plan and specified water resource protection, again, through implementation of its minimum control measures in its stormwater pollution prevention plan. And um, similar to Deep Haven and Greenwood, uh, coordination through annual meetings and regulatory coordination. And again, um, similar to Deep Haven and Greenwood, the district will continue to implement its rules and the district will retain local government unit status for the wetland the staff recommendation is approval of Woodland's local plan. Move approval. Second. Comment or question? Those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? <clears throat> What's the um, count now on remaining plans to come to us? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm pleased with the progress. It's not a yes. criticism in any way. Yes. So remaining plans, I believe we're at um, 15 now. So mm -hmm. that would be 13 remaining. Um, since the update on status of local water management plans at the end of the year last year, mm -hmm. uh, we did read there were four plans outstanding that we hadn't received. We received two of those. So there are two plans still outstanding to be received. Um, both of those cities have requested the six month extension from the Met Council on their comprehensive plans. And um, just to report too that the Met Council is actively coordinating on the status of local water plans as they are reviewing city comp plans, which um, have been flooding in, so. Okay, well thank you for all your work with the cities on this. Appreciate it. I have 11.8 is resolution 19011, Anna Brown. Thank you, President White, managers. Um, I'm here seeking approval of a change order to the um, construction barrier contract with Blackstone Contracting. Um, that contract was awarded in October of 2018 following a competitive quote process. Um, at the time, all quotes exceeded the engineer's estimate of probable costs. Um, Blackstone provided the low quote at 170000 approximately. Um, compared to the engineer's estimate of 120,000. 
Um, that contract was approved with the understanding that staff would return with the board or would work with the contractor um, to find any cost savings and then would return to the board um, to update them on those cost savings and then also that the board would approve any change orders um, reflecting changes to the contract before issuing the notice to proceed to the contractor. Um, at this time, we've worked with the contractor to reduce the barrier construction costs, um, and the revised contract amount is $125,690, um, as reflected in the change order attached to your resolution. Um, the difference uh, between the engineer's estimate of probable costs of $120,000 and that contract amount can be absorbed um, through the Lassard Sam's grant through an administrative approval process. Um, those cost savings are almost entirely due to changes in the um, means of installation, primarily of the pilings. Um, the original plan set had the pilings going in. They're, they're about 15-foot pilings um, that would be installed. Um, their screw pilings being installed with a large pile driver. Um, we worked with Blackstone uh, Contracting, and they identified an alternative means where essentially those piles would be um, pieced out when they ordered them, um, and they would be installed um, by Blackstone Contracting um, in segments and then um, could be uh, attached in, in place. Um, so in so doing, they don't have to work with a subcontractor, um, and it not only saves their, their costs, but it increases accuracy um, of the installation. They're working with smaller equipment. They can make sure that they're placed at the right intervals, which is really important because, as you recall, the design, there are piles secured um, into the creek bed, and then those grates that serve as the barriers are being installed into, um, into those piles. Um, so following the approval of the change order, um, the project mobilization could occur as soon as next week um, following some you know, administrative finalization. Uh, we have talked to the contractor about timeline, and he's expressed some concern about the recent warm weather um, impacting the ice conditions, um, so more likely it would happen uh, the following week or, or soon thereafter. Um, and the plan is to start with Highland Road Bridge, as that requires the most um, that requires the ice cover the most significantly, and then the smaller barrier um, is, is sort of less of an issue. Um, in addition to approving the change order, um, the resolution establishes administrative approval of subsequent change orders moving forward um, in an amount not to exceed 10%. Um, so with that, staff's recommendation is to uh, approve the change order for that barrier construction contract. Move approval. Motion to adopt 19-011. Is there a second? Second. Commander Shackleton, is there any question or comment further for this? Manager Olson? That's a significant savings. Thank you for the extra work. Yes. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Thank you. We'll move to 11-9, um, Resolution 19-012, and that is Mr. Whisker. Yes, uh, President White, Managers, 11.9, uh, Resolution 19-12 is for adoption of the district's compensation policy. Uh, you'll recall we reviewed components of this uh, at the December 13th Operations Committee, and then we presented a draft at the December 20th board meeting. And I'm not going to go through it in detail because that's what we did at the last meeting. But the policy essentially starts to outline um, what the district pays because it attaches the pay plan, um, how we're going to pay, and, and why we're doing it. It's our philosophy. And in the document, you'll notice there's several sections that cover the district's compensation philosophy and goals, how we're going to administer the compensation plan, how it's going to be maintained, new hire provisions. And then sort of the meat of it outlines the district's perspective on range penetration, how people will move through the salary ranges, tied to performance considerations. And then one of the things that we worked in there were the compensation ratios, which uh, is another yardstick combined with our philosophy and performance expectation, performance um, considerations, starts to provide um, guidance for staff on 
how quickly individuals might move through the range over time and how sizable an adjustment is warranted in any particular year. So it starts to get a little bit more objective than frameworks we might have had in the past. On the 20th, there, were, um, there was good discussion and we stepped through it section by section. There were a couple of comments. Um, only one of them made their way into redline format and that's outlined in your packet. Manager Loftus, and I think the board tended to agree, had commented that in section three, maintaining the compensation plan, um, there was language that we would do a compensation and classification market study as needed, but no less frequent than every five years. And the modification was just to change that, to move away from a requirement and more of a recommendation that every five years we'd consider doing a market study. <coughs> That red line is in there. The other um, question that was raised, and then there's some discussion that was raised by Manager Becker, who I've, I've circled back with and closed the loop on. Um, he had questioned that um, if you look at the compensation ratios, which range from 83% to 116%, that, that that range of 33 points doesn't match our range spread for salaries. And I'd clarified, I'd, I probably wasn't on top of my game the night of the meeting, but um, the salary range, uh, which provides a 40% spread, is calculated by taking the delta of the top end of the range minus the bottom end of the range. So what the total cash movement is divided by the low end of the range, and that gives you a 40% spread. And we've used that same framework to calculate the compensation ratio. So when you think about it, the top end of the salary range for every job is 116% the midpoint, and the low end of the salary range is 83% the midpoint. So these are the right breakdowns. I close a loop with him, confirmed that that made sense and he was clear, and um, that's why that change hasn't been made. So unless there are questions or more discussion, this is on your docket for consideration for action tonight. Thank you, Mr. Whisker. Is there a motion to adopt 1912? Approval. Manager Miller, is there a second? Second. Manager Olson, any further questions or comments? All those in favor, please. Wait, say wait. Uh, there's oh. uh, Manager Locke. I just had uh, one comment. Uh, mm -hmm. Despite this coming through the Operations Committee, I don't know that we ever voted on it, but um, just so the board, which I think they're aware, knows I'll be voting against this because I believe it's incomplete without addressing benefits. At the same time. So. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Motion carries. Move to resolution uh, 1913 authorization to implement the compensation plan. <coughs> President White managers, so resolution 1913, um, we've, is for authorization to implement the class and comp plan. So it's really all about the cost to implement and the recommended budget for implementing. So um, we're all the class and comp work that we've done over the last year that culminated on December 20th where you approved a pay plan, which are the job grades and the salary ranges that go along with them. You just voted to approve the compensation policy, which out, which attaches that plan and outlines how we'll administer the plan and implement it over time. And then this resolution um, recommends how to implement it and the budget associated with implementing it. So if you recall, we had worked with uh, liais I had worked with the liaisons to look at a range of cost to implement scenarios, and we'd presented two options to the operations committee um, that were reviewed on December 13th. That information wasn't discussed, but was included in your packet on the 20th. And those options for cost to implement are to implement the pay structure that you have approved in 2019, which is essentially making salary adjustments for staff based on the new positions that we've created. So very quickly, that with regards to the two options for cost, the both options adjust individuals that are below the minimum range, the minimum salary ranges that have been established that adjust individuals to the minimum range. And then both options include approximately 
$10,000 in hiring flexibility for the range of positions that we're currently recruiting and placing. So a project manager, our GIS technician, and some of our seasonal staff. Um, option one, after you um, factor in adjusting to minimum range and the reserve of $10,000 flexibility for the new hires that we're considering provides a remaining $13,000 all within budget um, for additional adjustments for staff across the organization. And included in that, the liaisons and the committee would ask that we'd frame uh, what consideration for adjustment would be left for the administrator. In option one, out of that 13,000, it earmarks one to two percent. Option two provides beyond option one an additional $28,000 in direct salary adjustments, but is a total budget amendment of $32,000 when you factor in payroll tax and PURA. And um, option two is um, the option that staff is recommending um, for reasons that um, based on the compensation policy that you've adopted and making sure that we um, <coughs> provide the most amount of range movement this year for individuals while remaining fiscally responsible, um, that is what I am recommending and that's for your consideration this evening. While that is out of budget, um, you'll note in the packet materials that that would be paid for in 2019 out of our operational reserves that we have. And all of these options moving forward would require ongoing investment through the, the budget levy process. So that's for your consideration this evening and I'll take any questions you have. Thank you. Is there a motion to adopt resolution 1913? Move approval. Is there a second? Manager Olson. Yep. Questions or comments? Those in favor, please say aye. Oh, manager Loftus again. Sorry to comment on this one again. Um, I guess if we move forward with the recommendation on option two, I would be supportive. I would support option one. Um, I think that it accomplishes the goals of what we've been working on for the past year, and it definitely moves us in the right direction. I don't support going over budget um, for additional movement. I think um, I'm happy to consider that in less than six months when we look at the next budget cycle and weigh that against all the other projects and priorities we have. I think option one certainly accomplishes what we set out to do. And I um, will defend our budget process and not going over it if it's not an emergency, which this isn't, and it certainly accomplishes our goals. So I would advocate for staying within budget. Um, however, if you your motion is on option two, you'll know why I won't be voting for that. Thank you. Other comments or questions? Andrew Shackleton? I agree with Andrew Loftus. I mean, I... <coughs> I don't have a problem with option two as a structure and as a plan. <clears throat> and if there's a, if there is a purpose and, and, and an outcome that would be derived by by putting it into this year's budget prior to next year's budget, I'd like later greater clarity. But I, I do think that structuring this as part of next year's budget makes a lot of sense. Um, and I don't. I guess I don't know why we want to take up the capacity of our operational <coughs> reserves without like a demand on the on the reserve. Like, is there is there a rationale or a reason for? And I wasn't at, at the, the meeting of the twentieth, but if there's a if there's a rationale, I'd love to hear. Uh, <clears throat> you know, this this kind of completes. Uh, I, I, uh, two or three year uh, reorganization of the and uh, reorientation of the uh, of the mission and the vision and and uh, reorganizing <coughs> the uh, staff uh, and refocusing the whole organization on on the mission um, and I 
think that we've done a really good job uh, on all the elements of that uh, up to this point. And I think we should just finish it. We're not. Uh, you know, I don't have the experience with budgets that you do, but uh, but I've examined hundreds of them for loans and in in uh, uh, debt financings over the over the years for government and nonprofits, and we're not over budget. We're not spending money that we don't have. We're just spending money uh, from a different uh, allocation. Uh, but it's an ongoing cost. You can't fund an ongoing personnel cost with one-time money. It doesn't work. Well, we've been doing that way for ten years, and we're we're um, we're uh, our, our our budgets are better prepared now, uh, thanks to uh, the way we approach it from a from a mission statement rather than adding on to last year's line items. Uh, and uh, I, th I think this is, uh, you know, I, I agree with your concern, but I think it's a, it's a minor uh, technical concern. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I, I think okay. it is, you know, yeah, because we're not, we don't have to increase the levy. We've got money in place. If we had the information that we got now when we did the budget, we would have been, so we increased that line item. Sure. Well, we increased it. There was a 9.5% um, personnel budget increase allocated for this implementation. So it, this is above that. Yeah. Uh, so there was money budget. Uh, but I, I think it just, it just gets everything in order and to move on. And um, I think... Uh, uh, I, I, I think it just completes the comprehensive nature of our reorganization and uh, recognizes uh, the, the, st the staff that we have and we want to keep. And, uh, and you don't think option one does that? N well, I don't think it puts it to rest. Right. Uh, I think this is kind of the final thing now. You know, we've got it set. And, we got the new policies in place, and uh, we're aligning all the programs to the mission, and uh, got the, the different focus groups uh, uh, all working towards the uh, uh, notice I didn't use the word department. Uh, <laughs> we got the focus groups working towards the, the mission and the goals, and I, I just think it's it's just I don't want to be dealing with this all the time. Yeah. I'm going to be dealing with salaries in the budget, no matter what. <clears throat> okay. So you're not putting it to rest, I promise you that. Thank you. Other comments? All those in favor of adopting the resolution, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Motion carries. Um, I realized that I skipped committee appointments when we it was back for mm. officers. Um, so I'd like to do that back in now. I, I'd like to hold off on that. Uh, okay. Because I, I think we should have some discussion uh, about what the committees are going to do. I, for one, am satisfied if I could continue mm -hmm. uh, with uh, the progress we're making and using committees properly. But I don't think we're anywhere near where we should be uh, on um, setting the agendas and uh, and uh, follow through on discussions, etc., and uh, presentations and a whole bunch of other stuff to make the committee uh, more more effective as a board uh, as a subdivision of the of a board workshop. Board workshops were I thought were disasters. Uh, we never came to conclusions. We went on for hours and hours, and uh, uh, we uh, never, never accomplished much. I think we're doing a lot better with the committees, but I think there's, we can make them much more effective than uh, if we think some more about how they're organized and and, and what we're going to have on the agendas and who sets the agendas and what follow-ups are going to be at the committee level or whether. How we pass it on to the board. So, 
With, with that, I, I'd just like to ask could we hold it off for... Is there any objection? All right, good. Then we'll move to the administrator's report, Mr. Whisker. <coughs> Maybe starting where we just left off, President White Managers, is there any um, sort of suggested next steps on flushing out some of those questions with committee? Would you like to have the committee chairs and President White meet with me or schedule that for discussion or think about it? We'll let you know. Okay. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> we'll think about it. I like that. Um, I've got a, a couple notes on here with regards to water level, like we usually do from Tiffany. Nicomas Weir's uh, remained open since October 11 and is going to stay open until we finally reach run out. We're, we're about a tenth of an inch, um, tenth of a foot, I'm sorry, away from run out elevation. And um, Mooney Lake has, has still been pumping intermittently. Current lake levels at 988.8, and so it's got eight tenths of a foot before that stop pumping so it kind of gives you a sense of um, just where those lake levels are and some of the issues we've <coughs> had with getting rain in the middle of winter and a lot of the, the melt events that we've had. <laughs> that sounds like a comment. <laughs> <laughs> is, that, is that a comment? <laughs> Seems like a, a, a climate change comment. <laughs> <laughs> um, no Pause for water. <laughs> Sort of along the lines of, of water level um, discussions, President White and Manager Becker, Joel Carlson, and myself met with Representative Wagenius on December 27th to discuss her ongoing concerns and engagement of residents around the Nokomis area. And we spent the bulk of the time really fleshing out where, uh, what her plans were and what the agenda focus would be for the um, Energy and Climate Finance uh, Committee, um, which is going to start meeting here next week. They're going to be meeting every Tuesday and Thursday. And generally what she had outlined is a um, pretty linear set of affairs where they're going to move from defining the impact that climate change is having on the state <coughs> at a statewide level, sort of a, a global issue definition, which will be facilitated by academics from U of M to outline monetary impact, impact to different sectors like forestry, ag, cities, water, those sorts of things. And then they're going to work their way down more specific and culminate in um, a discussion of policy solutions. So staff is going to be planning to attend those committees. We're coordinating with Mr. Carlson. I think it was a productive meeting and we'll, we'll report back on how those discussions are going. Um, I had a note here for a construction update on Arden Park, but I think it asked Mike to provide <coughs> a construction update on pond dredging and Arden Park and FEMA repairs um, for all that work, so he'll, he'll tackle that in just a moment. Uh, with regards to the Minnehaha Parkway Regional Trail Master Planning, you received an update on that at the last Planning and Policy Committee. The Park Board is moving forward. They're holding a concept workshop, so for a lot of those smaller sort of area plans, they've produced two alternatives and they'll be getting feedback from the public on those um, as part of a series of meetings one of which that's on January 31st 6 to 8 p.m. at Lyndhurst Rec Center and there'll be another one on February 7th 6 to 8 p.m. at Nokomis Community Center so we'll make sure that those are on your radar closer to the date if you want to attend. Um, I'm going to pass this around. Manager Miller brought this in it's the uh, official magazine of the city of Edina, and in there they've got a nice profile on the Arden Park restoration project. So I'll hand that around. And then just with regards to Arden, before we get into the construction update, I just wanted to mention and take an opportunity to mention and, and give um, Laura some commendation here. We had a, the pre-construction meeting that I think we'd already reported on, heard back from our contractors as well as Chris Meehan and Mike, that we've essentially set a, a new standard in preparedness for those pre-con meetings, just in terms of how they were run. I think the contractors were extremely surprised with just the, the rigor and discipline and, and coming out of the gate with extremely high expectations. And Laura's also been working pretty closely with concerned residents um, now that we've started construction and you're starting to see the dam removal, concrete slab being torn up, a lot of the veg removal. 
And as you know, there's been ongoing concerns throughout the concept and the design through the bidding process. So she's keeping her fingers on the pulse of the community through construction. And <coughs> had a series of meetings recently with, with residents and we track um, a lot of our projects. We track feedback from communities on Nextdoor app, which is where communities are sort of chatting with each other in a neighborhood context about what's happening. And a very concerned uh, resident had posted to the Nextdoor app for the Arden Park neighborhood that she had met with the project manager, Laura Damjancic, sat around the kitchen table, fleshed out her concerns, got real facts, real answers, had her concerns managed, and, and had quoted that her faith in the project and the process had been restored because of her work with Laura. So I just wanted to give her an honorable mention for going the extra mile to um, communicate with the residents around the project that have historically had concerns, have concerns through construction, and it's nice every once in a while when you're able to change someone's mind. Kudos. So with that, Mike, if you can give us a quick rundown on construction projects. Uh, thanks, James. Managers, you'll likely recall that we have, I believe, six active construction projects going right now this winter, so I think that's an all-time high. Um, and that's just the overarching project um, title. If you count the in individual or discrete project elements within FEMA or PONS, et cetera, it's many more than that. So it's been, it's been fun watching um, staff sort of juggle and manage all of, all of the projects that are going on. Right now with PONS, uh, Janet Jolney is has two pond dredging projects going right now, Pamela Pond in Edina and uh, Dave McCoska in Minneapolis. Pamela has been dewatered. You might recall there's a, a large wall associated with that project. That was actually poured this week, and they'll start the excavation next week, um, weather permitting, of course. When they start uh, excavation there, they will start dewatering at Dave McCoska. They've constructed the berm there to separate cell one and two. and. Um, anticipate being done dewatering and while finishing excavation of Pamela moving or remobilizing down to Bidet McCoskey and having, um, having that start probably in the <coughs> next two weeks. So that's where we are with the ponds. With Arden, um, you know, James great, gave a great sort of commendation to Laura. She's been doing a fantastic job out there. As Manager Miller noted, all the vegetation has work is essentially done. I believe they were finishing up today um, for tree removals. They were doing the root wads and, and those um, those trees last, so that should have been finished today. The demolition for the entire project is essentially complete. They've taken the shelter building down, the playground is out, the dam has been removed, and the concrete underlayment under the bridge has also been removed. And Chris Mia noted that he was out there yesterday and saw fish moving through the old dam location. They were carp. Um, <laughs> but there also was a very patriotic eagle sitting next to the dam, old dam, picking the carp off uh, one by one. So it was, it was working out just fine um, for, for ecology. Carp removal, there we go. Yeah, it's new, new carp removal. We are overall uh, slightly, I think, slightly ahead of schedule with that project, and things have been going well. I think if they get a little bit colder weather, they would like that. Um, but they are planning to start excavation major excavation next week on the creek and they'll start with the creek channel that will be in the dry areas so they can work without um, well you know seeing if the levels go down or they get a hard freeze on the creek itself um, and so stay tuned for more project updates but that's been going really well we have a, a very good contractor team out there um, regarding the fema projects in minneapolis we've finished site 30 which was the first site that was the eroded slope near the parking lot um, that went really well. They've started on the soil lifts actually as of today at site 26, which is the site directly east of 35W. And then next week, they anticipate weather permitting heading below the falls and doing uh, that series of projects sort of in order as they work their way down there. And all is going well with that project um, so far. The barriers Anna gave an update on, we should see a lot of that work mobilizing maybe next week if we can get a cold snap um, for sure so they can start with Highland Road and move from there. And then lastly, the utility work out in Six Mile for all the aeration is uh, essentially right on schedule. The, con uh, the conduit was installed in December. They've um, received all the materials this week for installing all the electrical panels and systems. They should be up and running um, by the end of the month, which will be the perfect, perfect timing for aerating if needed on any of the lakes that, um, on Mud or South Blunston, which are the two lakes that will be, will be set to go this year. So 
With that, happy to take any questions on projects. I suppose I should note demolition is complete as well, and we're out of that site, uh, out of 325 Blake Road. So. Thank you. Any questions for Mike? <coughs> Sounds good. Right. Sounds busy. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Then we'll move to the last item on our agenda, and um, I would like a motion to convene in closed session to discuss uh, redevelopment sale of 325 Blake Road. Hopkins. Motion from Manager Shackleton. Is there a second? Second. Manager Olson. Those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? And then, yes. clarify again that this is a discussion around the valuation of that property for sale as a district asset. Thank you. That's what I intended. Mm -hmm.